Hey, good evening and welcome back to Kingdom 101. It's an initiative of our Keepers Awakening. And I'm saying this for the benefit of those who are listening to the recording. If you want to know more about our Keepers Awakening, you can go to our website, ourkeepersawakening.org, or even uh, check us out on our Facebook page so they can keep in touch with us. Okay, we're back with our study of Matthew. And this evening, the title is Bread Talk. And I know it's familiar for those of us in Singapore. But really, we're going to be talking about bread tonight. So I really hope you had your dinner and you've had something to eat. Otherwise, if you look at the picture, it's really quite nice, isn't it? Huh? Uh, quite fluffy and, uh, and uh, I'm sure you, want, you would like to sink your teeth you know, even into that wonderful piece of bread down there. But before we get into the topic proper, let's look at some foundations which we laid um, last week. You know, we read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 last week. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. We explored some pointers as a foundation because this next three sessions, we will be looking at the three temptations of Jesus Christ. And if you remember, and even if you can't remember and you have not heard the message yet, here's just some points for you. We looked at the after and the before, the times when temptations would come and we have to be on our guard, we want to be aware. Usually it comes after a high point and we think that, wow, you know, we are right on top, nothing is going to happen to us and suddenly it catches us off guard. It can also come before we are launched into something that God has in plan or in store for us. Our assignments, the things that He wants us to do and, you know, before we get onto that assignment, we can be derailed. The next thing we learned is that the Spirit wants to lead us and we love to be led by the Spirit, but we don't always like where the Spirit leads. It's not always a comfortable thing. It's not always to res Resorts World Sentosa, you know, or theme park or something that's comfortable. Sometimes God leads us into places where it might be difficult. We also found that God's ways are always higher ways, but His ways would include the wilderness. So if you find yourself in a wilderness, don't fight it. Don't fight it. I know we don't like it very much. But if you know you're there for a season and for a reason, then learn fast, learn well, so that God can take you through and also help you grow through that process. We learned the two sides of the same coin in a trial about temptation as well as a test. And they're really two sides of the same thing. In every situation, there is a temptation that's presented to us and Satan is the one who tempts. But there's also a test and God is the one who tests. You remember this? That in the temptation, it is a test to find out your flaws to discredit you, to disqualify you. But in a test, in that word, is always to find out what's good about you so that you can be promoted and you can do even better the next time. We looked at our enemy, and I hope you're convinced, the enemy is real. Not only is he real, he is real sneaky. Yeah? He twists things and he will use words and he comes at you without you even noticing it and you have to understand his strategy. So with that, this evening, we're going to go into the next two verses. In verse 3 and 4, Now when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So this evening, we will look at the very first of three temptations. I want you to know that it starts in the wilderness, but you will see it actually goes into increasing heights of places. From the wilderness to the temple and then to the mountain. There is like an increasing intensity and it gets higher up. 
the devil takes Jesus or meets Jesus in the wilderness, brings him to a temple, and then later on takes him up onto the mountain. And in all these things, you will see that it is actually the enemy's attempt. Now, that word attempt is interesting again. It's made up of two words. And literally, it means to tempt. It is the enemy's attempt to question and to confuse identity, always. Identity is always challenged when the enemy comes against us. Not only that, it is also his attempt to distract and as well as to detract from your mission and from your assignment. And in all three instances, Jesus would use Scripture to counter the enemy. So these are the common things we will see through all the three temptations that sort of give us a representation of all the temptations we would actually face. But before we get into the points, I want to bring you good news. Let's be clear. Making and eating bread is not a sin. You see, tonight we're going to talk about bread, right? Yeah, so I don't want you to think that, oh man, you know, you know if, I, if, you know, if Jesus had made bread from stone, oh, that's a sin. No, making bread is not a sin. Eating bread is also not a sin. But behind this one temptation, we will look at four subpoints. And these four subpoints are related, they're all linked, um, they're all part of each other. But I think it helps us as we break this down, understand a little bit more what the enemy is trying to do when he tempts Jesus. And I pray that as we go through these points, it would help us also examine ourselves against what the Word of God says and how we are actually living according to it. So if you're ready, will you join me? Let's pray and we will get quickly into these four points. Father, thank you, Lord, for the example of Jesus. And this evening, we are going to get into His temptation and how He overcame, Lord. And Lord, in it, Lord, we also want to learn the enemy's strategy so that we will not be caught off guard. And so I pray, Lord, every detail that is being shared tonight. Holy Spirit, please lead us. Help us to understand it. Help me to share it so that in all things, Lord, Jesus will be glorified and He will receive the highest honor. And so we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This temptation is about the devil coming to Jesus and says, look, you know, if you're the son of God, I mean, look at all these stones all around you. There's nothing that's stopping you right now. You can turn these stones into bread. Now, of course, Jesus answers from a passage in Deuteronomy. But behind this temptation, we actually see it's also it's a temptation of physical desires and dependence. When Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, Afterward, he was hungry. Have you heard this saying? A hungry man is an angry man, right? How many of you have snapped at someone before because you're hungry? Or you couldn't think straight because you hadn't had, okay, before you had coffee, that's another thing. But we need that food, right? We, we need the, the, the sugar or, or something in, in us. And hunger is a, Craving or hunger is a fleshly desire. And Satan wants to tempt us always that we would depend on these fleshly things or material things or physical things. The fleshly or physical desires that we have, they are very natural. But the enemy would want to capitalize on these to throw you off track. So let me ask you, what are you physically hungry or craving for sometimes? Here the example is food. That's very common. For some others, a physical desire could be sex. And if you are pushed to, a, uh, to an extreme, then there's a lusting after sex. That's why when we use the word lust, it's usually associated with something that's sexual or pornographic. But the word lust simply means to crave. Are you hungry for power? Are you hungry for money? I mean, look at the elections. Everything was about money. Are you hungry for success, for fame? What is it? Because if you are hungry for something and you are willing to trade to satisfy that hunger, 
Do you know something? That the enemy is willing and happy to meet your need. He's happy to give it to you because you're willing to give up something bad enough so that you can have this. So when we look at fleshly desires and cravings, I mean, look at Esau. Esau is a character in the Bible from Genesis, and we know that he was a hunter. He went out there and he was, he was getting food or, or, or you know, hunting game and so on. When he came back, he was hungry. And Jacob was there and says, well, I tell you what, I cooked a real good meal. Can you smell it? Mmm, yum, yum. You want this? And Esau says, yeah. Genesis chapter 25, verse 32. I am about to die. That's what he said. I'm so hungry, I'm famished. I'm willing to, to give up anything for this food. Now, what did he give up? Now, Jacob was sneaky. Jacob actually says, I want you to give me your birthright. Give up that birthright and you can satisfy your stomach. So Esau says, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? It means nothing. I mean, come on. So that physical need for that moment was more important than something that, was, that, that would be worth a lot more. And in the book of Hebrews, later we are told that Esau gave up his birthright for a morsel of food. And he sought to retrieve that and he couldn't get it back anymore. See, the enemy in a way was also tempting Jesus to give up his right. Give up this right to rule. Are you hungry? Just eat, no problem. Give up this right to rule. Because if you just, if you just do that and just satisfy this craving... That's more important. Come on, if you die, Jesus, from hunger, you can't rule anymore. You see how the enemy plays in our mind? And so we are tempted in the same way. That's why the book of Hebrews warns us. You cannot and should not sin willfully. How do we sin willfully? What does it mean? It means that we are pandering to our fleshly and our physical cravings. And so we give in. We know it's wrong, but we give in. And as we do that willfully, there comes a point where we are saying, my, my birthright as a Christian, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, everything that I have, that's not worth anything. I want to fulfill my desires first. It's a temptation of physical desires and dependence. Look at Israel as a nation. We see this in Numbers chapter 11. We are told that they yielded to intense craving. Now, were they hungry? Now, here, this is an interesting point, you know. They were not hungry. God had given them supernaturally manna every day. They were not hungry, but they were dissatisfied. I, I don't want this manna. It's, it's, it's baked manna. It's Steamed manna, it's fried manna, it's stewed manna, it's sweet and sour manna, it's poached manna. I, I want something with the manna. And it says they yielded to intense craving. And they turned against God. You see, your physical desires or your physical dissatisfaction can cause you even to complain against God, to turn against God, to be upset with God. Have you been there? That when you're lacking something, you start to question God, right? You start to wonder, why? Why is it like that? Why is God so like this? How come the other person has? How come I don't have? How come they prayed and they got it? Oh, look at those wonderful testimonies. How about me? Psalm 106 verse 14 and 15 records this. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. They lusted exceedingly. We're talking food here. Quails here. They lusted exceedingly. And God, it says, God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Do you know sometimes the richest people are the saddest people? It's funny, right? And, and yet many of us desire to get rich. Because we think that if we would be rich and we have all the money in the world, it would solve all our problems. 
And it scares me with this one line because sometimes we can pray for something, we get it. And God is just saying, all right, you want it? I'll just allow you to have it. And then you see how good or how bad it is. So God, in inverted commas, gave them their request. In our words, it means they ans- God answered their prayers. Be careful what you pray for. God answers their prayers, gave them their request, and sent leanness into their soul. Oh man, theologically, you've got to wrestle with that one, boy. What are you asking for? And sometimes God will say, okay, fine, I'll give it to you, and you see whether is it really that good. Because God knows who He is. He, he's secure, you see. So my line is, no use being fat but dead. Right? I mean, they had quails, so much quail. It was in their teeth, and then they died. Go read Numbers 11. It's crazy. It's like eating to death. See, when we look at this temptation of physical desires and dependence, we we have to understand that God knows that we need these things. He created us with these desires. He knows we have these needs. And God provides for our physical needs. When we get to Matthew chapter 6, We will revisit this where Jesus preaches and he says this, don't you know that life is more than what you eat and what you wear? And Singaporeans, we need to understand and remember this. Because wherever we go, it's food. Wherever we go, it's a shopping mall. Life is more than these. God knows we need the physical things. But these physical things are not the end all and the be all. There's something that is more important. There's something that life is all about. And that's why Jesus answers from Deuteronomy. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. You notice Jesus didn't say you cannot eat bread. You shall not live by, that means rely on, these physical things alone. But man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, there is a realm that is higher than the physical realm. And that realm is more important and more critical to us. There is something that is of eternal value that it would do us well to hold on to that rather than to crave only for what is temporary in this life. And so Jesus in that in that passage of Matthew chapter 6, of course, you know, he ends with verse 33. He says, you focus on the kingdom of God. You focus on His kingdom. You live right by His righteousness. All these things will be taken care of. Don't be tempted beyond what these things are important of or about. Jesus says, don't even have to worry about this. Your Father knows you have need of these things. Amen? He knows and He will supply. Your part is to, is to focus on the kingdom. Understand the righteousness. Know your assignment. And as you move on these, will the Father not provide the resource? He will. The question is, will you be satisfied? And if you say no, then nothing will satisfy you. See, the kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God. Every word, every instruction, that's why that's what Jesus meant. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, when the king says, I will live by that. While the king decrees, I will move by that. Anything else does not matter. Even if the king should have told me 40 days, don't eat anything. Yes, sir, I will live by that word. That's what it means to have the kingdom of God with us. His rule and his reign. Rely on Him. Live by His Word. Why? Because He's a loving King and He's a good King. And He knows everything about us. And there are times where the Lord allows that hunger or that lack within us. Because in that hunger or lack, it reveals what is in our heart. You read Deuteronomy 8, it says there, I allowed you in this wilderness 40 years to humble you, to test you, to find what was really in your heart. See, I don't know what's in your heart. You can come each week and I'm very thankful, but I really don't know what's in your heart. But if I think we go through 40 days together, wow, we get to know each other really well. 
it begins to show. The true colors come out. We know that the physical bread is enough, but the spiritual bread is the most important. So Jesus in John chapter 6, He says to the people, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. See, he was talking to the crowds again and referring to this um, episode or this event of God providing bread from heaven. Manna just, just came. It just appeared. It was a heavenly bread. But Jesus is saying, look, Moses is not really giving you the real bread from heaven. I mean, that's physical. But my Father is now giving you the true bread. Verse 33, For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to Him, Lord, give us this bread always. They want it. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to Me shall never hunger, and he who believes in Me shall never thirst. Isn't it interesting that the tempter came to tempt the bread with bread? Yeah? He comes to Jesus, who is the true bread of life, the true bread from heaven, and it says, look, Jesus, if you don't turn these stones to bread, you are gone. <laughs> Jesus definitely knew who he was, right? Looks at him and says, you don't even know who you're talking to. I'm the living word. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I am that living word that stands before you. And you know, today when we talk about the word, we, we, would, we would refer to the Bible and that's, that's not wrong. But can I tell you that Jesus is more than the Bible? Would you agree with me? How can you contain Jesus in, in, in 66 books? I know we can't even finish this book properly. That's how much bigger God is. You, you cannot contain God in a book. He reveals Himself. Jesus is not just a printed word in a book. He's called the Logos. And the word Logos is from where we, we get our English understanding, logic or a certain system, right? That God has put in place in this world, all through this entire world, mathematically, logically, 2 plus 2 equals 4. I, I don't care what language you speak, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Amen? Or you argue? No, right? Yeah. So mathematics is, is logic. It's just there. The entire system of the world. That's what it means. That's why God created this entire world through the Logos, through Jesus. Everything that was made through Him. It's the entire system of God, the wisdom of God, the thinking of God, the ways of God. That's what it means. Jesus the Word. And this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so I tell people, receiving Jesus is not just saying, oh Lord, I receive you. Receiving Jesus means to receive the Logos, meaning to say, oh Lord, I am willing to receive God's wisdom system, the way of doing things. Change this faulty logic that is within me. That's called receiving the Logos. See, the spiritual word, the spiritual bread, it's more important than the physical bread that we have. So first point, this, Satan was really trying to get Jesus to focus on the physical need. The second temptation within the larger temptation is the temptation of self-preservation and survival. You know, when you're pushed to an edge, when you're painted into a, a corner, as it were, do you find yourself saying, desperate times call for desperate measures? Right? And so if you are like Jesus, hungry after 40 days, would there be a desire or, or this, this self-preservation mode kicking in? Yeah, I, better, I better save myself. I better do something about this. Otherwise, I may not live much longer you know, after this and it will be not much use to this entire world since I'm going to save it. And so our theology, when it comes to that point of desperation, is always tested and is always questioned. In your good times, you don't think about all these things. I mean, some of us may be looking for a job. Some of us may be 
um, stuck with finances. Some of us, you know, are, are stuck in a, or in a relationship that's difficult or we are really pushed to one corner. You understand the desperation that is there, isn't it? But when times are good, we don't bother about these things. And usually when we are pushed and our back is against the wall, we, we, we want to fight back. It's a survival mode. And questions start to go on within our hearts. Where is God in all this? See, the enemy is trying to, to get Jesus or to get us in these kind of times to question God. Are you sure you're the son of God? You know, are you sure he's that father? Oh, you are, you're well loved. You're, yes, you're, he's well pleased. Now, where is he now? You, you better help yourself. So have you heard this line before? God helps those who help himself. Right? Yeah. I better do something to help God. Lah. You know, maybe He needs my help. Now, there's one thing to do our part because God tells us what to do when it's to do our part. But it's another to, do our, to think we are doing our part when we're actually trying to help God do something. I mean, you can ask Abraham and ask Sarah. What happened when they tried to help God? They got Ishmael. And so, when we try to have this self-preservation mode kick in, or this survival mentality... Things can go crazy. And let me give you some Old Testament examples. See, Saul, as the first king of Israel, we know what kind of a king he was. He started out quite well. But after that, there was one episode in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 5 to 14. Samuel actually told Saul, you wait for me. And after that, I will come. And I will do that offering because you're not allowed to do this offering. And he waited seven days, and this time was set by Samuel. In other words, Samuel says, I'll come, means I'll become. It is a word from the Lord. But Saul started to see the people scatter. He was losing his congregation suddenly. The, the numbers became very thin. Samuel hadn't arrived. The, the enemy, the Philistines, the threat was coming. They were, you know, and all that. And then he did the offering. You see, it was a survival mode. I better do something so that God will receive the offering and, and everything will be okay again. So he says this, I felt compelled. Compelled by what? Compelled by a thinning congregation? <laughs> compelled by the, the enemy coming? Compelled by Samuel not being there? Or compelled by self-preservation? I'll look bad. I felt compelled and I offered a burnt offering. And this is what Samuel said to him, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord. See, God says something to you, you hold on to that. And I can tell you along the way, your knees might be shaking and you keep going back to the Word of God. Lord, did you say this? Do I hold on to this? Do I move? Do I stay? I need that Word from you. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see? That's what it means. You hear something from the Lord. Lord says it. This is it. I'm, I'm holding on to this. After that, he goes against the Amalekites. And God says, kill everyone. Don't spare anyone. What does Saul do? He spares Agag, the king, and he keeps the good stuff. And he says, I'm going to bring this as a sacrifice. And Samuel comes again and says, what have you done? What have you done? Oh, no, 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 I'm going to sacrifice. I, I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to do the good things. I, Lord, I saved the best for God. He says, you disobeyed. Don't you know to God, obedience is better than sacrifice. See, when we begin to take things into our own hands, but of course we have the story of David that comes after him. And we know this. David was persecuted by, by Saul. David was threatened by this king who knows now that he's going to lose the kingdom. And here is this next guy who is who's going to be taking over soon. So he chases David into the wilderness and David becomes a fugitive. And twice the Bible records that David finds Saul at his mercy. Saul was sleeping in the cave that David was hiding in. Now David could have gone into survival mode. <laughs> and even his soldiers told him, his captain said, Oh look, you know, the Lord has delivered the enemy into your hands. And David said, No, I didn't hear any instruction. And David waited for his time. You see the difference here? The temptation of self-preservation and survival. 
You know, in the New Testament, in Philippians chapter 4, I love this passage. And I know we quote this a lot in verse 13 of chapter 4, Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah? And I wonder, when people quote this verse, do they really understand what they're saying? Because in my teaching time, when I ask my students, what does verse 11 and 12 say before verse 13? No one can tell me. So in other words, they don't really understand the context. It just, it just sounds nice. You know, Christ strengthens me. But if you look at verse 11, it says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, do you understand the context? Paul is saying, look, I, I, I've had plenty. I've dined at the best restaurants. I've had nothing. I've hungered. I thirsted. You know, I, I, I've, I've got a lot. I've got nothing. Uh, people have given money. People have not given money. Whatever it is, it does not matter. My strength is found in Christ. Not in what I have. Not whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry. God's kingdom and His kingdom assignments do not depend on these. It depends on Christ. That's what it means. Today we use this statement like, oh, I need some strength for me, I post that. No. It's about contentment. Because many times when we don't have or, you know, when we want more, we go into self-preservation, survival. I need to do all these things so that I can have, so I can serve God. The Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> the Bible says you serve God whether you are full or whether you are empty. Really blows our mind, doesn't it? Yeah? Because I know all of us have been perhaps guilty at some point to say, Lord, if you bless me with a million dollars first, then I will serve you. It goes against Scripture, you see? The temptation of personal survival first. God's kingdom is upside down for us. He says, you serve me, I will ensure your survival. Third thing is about the temptation of acting independently of God. And we've already seen some examples there. And here really the question is, what did God say versus has God indeed said? Do you understand the difference? See, to act independently of God means I disregard what He has said to me. So if God tells me something or tells you something, either to do or not to do, to go or not to go, to give or not to give, that is what God has said. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God gives instruction to Adam, and Adam is supposed to be the head of the relationship. He should have shared that well with Eve. But the enemy would come, and he would ask, has God indeed said you sure or not? You mean don't do it? Uh? Are you like that? How? Chum le? Oh, you mean what? No money? Uh? Then how to survive? No la. You better do the responsible thing. Go and work 24 hours a day. Don't go to church. Don't read the Bible. Don't pray. God understands. You need the money. You, you see the difference here? So one is, what does God say to me? The other one is being challenged by the enemy you sure God said not? Cannot be that. See, that's a temptation. And that's why he said to Eve, has God indeed said? Right? He, he doesn't really get into anything. He just throws a, casts a little bit of doubt. And he say, oh yeah, true. Huh? I, I better, then all the rational comes in, right? You got to do your part. God helps those who help themselves. Da, 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 da. No, I, I, Admit, it's a fine line. Sometimes it's not as easy, right, to discern. But that's what a relationship with the Lord is all about. You make mistakes and you learn. You make mistakes and you learn again. Because God in these tests us to approve us. But the enemy wants to show us up as weak and not good. So look at Jesus. I believe Jesus could have turned those stones into bread. But he did not. 
Why? Because he didn't hear from the Father, I believe. Would you agree? And I mean, that's my speculation. Do you think Jesus would have whispered a, could have whispered a small, quick prayer? Uh, when, when, when the enemy says, come on, you know, since you're the son of God, if you're son, just turn these stones into bread. And, and Jesus goes, cannot, Dad. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And perhaps the Father, through the Holy Spirit, so sensitive? No. Oh, Jesus already knew. He didn't have to pray for some of these things, right? And so he says, no. I will only go by what my Father says. And that is true. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 19, the Son can do nothing of Himself. But what He sees the Father do, for whatever He does, the Son does in like manner. I, I want this kind of a relationship. I'm not there yet, my friends. I want to be able to see what my Father does and I can do it. I, I want to be able to hear from my Father in a way He says, okay, now you do this, then I go and do. You know, otherwise, I don't do. And I have to deal with that because the temptation of, oh, I, I need to do something, you know. I, otherwise, I'm feeling lazy or something. It just overwhelms me. How do I come to a restedness to know my Father, to hear my Father, to see my Father do. And I said, Lord, should I do this? And He says, go, I'll go. And I'll do it to the best of my ability. Could Jesus have turned the stones into bread? Yes. I mean, when He went to the wedding, He turned the water into wine. No problem. In the wilderness on the mountains, again, He feeds the 5,000, then the 4,000. This is no problemo. But he hears the Father, you see? He does not act independently apart from God. Look at Gethsemane, all the way through. Jesus wrestled. You read the Bible. Jesus had every human emotion. Do you know in one of the Gospels, it says that he was anxious. And he prayed so hard because the cross wasn't a nice thing. We don't understand it, you understand? Because we, we don't have execution by cross today. And we are not guilty of that. But the Bible actually says that he was anxious, he was praying. And finally, the Father, of course, heard his prayer and would have spoken to the Son. And the Son says, Not my will, but yours be done. Now, if you want to learn Christ's likeness, we have to learn this. Today, we are very practical and very pragmatic Christianity, is it not? Whatever works, God understands. I go into Scripture and it really flips me upside down. It's crazy. I, I must repent. I'm not living the way the Lord is asking me to. Now, some of you will be saying, that is radical. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they look at Jesus and they called him crazy. So if you want to be his disciples, as the teacher is, you would be too. So how I many of you want to be crazy? Are you ready to be radical? Amen. See, this is discipleship, friends. If any man wants to follow me, Jesus says, he must first deny himself. In other words, my own activities, my own preservation, my, my own way of thinking, my own agenda. Lord, I'm willing to lay this aside because yours comes first. That's discipleship. I'm sorry, it's not attending a class and finish 12 sessions and I'm a disciple. No. <laughs> how do we hear God and how do we obey? And the fourth temptation, as it were, you know, is the temptation of having to prove something, to prove a position and a power. I tell you, we all struggle with this. You know why? Because our, our own identity, our understanding of our identity in ourselves even, for, for starters, don't even talk about our identity in Christ. We are insecure in that. And we find a great need to either prove ourselves or to vindicate ourselves as Christians, don't you think? Or as people in ministry, for example. 
I mean, we, we start a ministry. This is a new ministry. You know how people will judge us? How many people come? Huh? How many books you sell? Huh? Right? And then, how many activities you do? What do you organize? Huh? And I tell you, it's the craziest thing. I have no answer. They won't ask me, so how's your ministry going? I said, I, uh, okay, I think. So what are you guys doing now? Uh, not very much. No, really. I mean, you know us now, right? What are we doing? Uh, not very much. And so these are the, this, these are the persons or person, you know, if they want to compare ministries, they will tell me how much they're doing. And I tell you, the temptation is for me also to say, my first print run sold out, you know. No more books, you know. You want to buy? Right? You see, we're trying to prove something. Oh, there must be more anointing. There has to be miracles. Yeah, I believe in miracles. But must it always be miracles? I don't know. You mean no one fell over when you pray for them, huh? I didn't leave with gold dust, just the haze. <laughs> I mean, come on. We're trying to prove something, is it not? And I fall for this temptation over and over again. We're trying to prove to be good, good Christians. Why? Because uh, I must have blessing. I must have favor. So I must have lots of money. Otherwise, there's no favor upon me. Where does the Bible say that? It's scary. And I know I've been guilty of it in the, in my, the way I've, I've talked about it. Or maybe I'm, I have not realized it, but I say it. So someone drives a certain car and someone drives another car, so this person is more blessed? No. Why? Because there's a temptation to prove something. So when the enemy looked at Jesus, he says, if you are the Son of God, and I've read various commentaries, they say the same thing. It's not questioning Jesus that he doesn't know he's the Son of God. It's better translated, since you are the Son of God. You, you Son of God, right? Now, since you're the Son of God, show me something, man. Come on, you're the Son of God. Now, since you are a Christian, you should this, 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 this. Since you are a leader in the ministry, you should this, this, this. You see, the enemy wants you to prove something through your position and through that power. And actually, he was trying to get Jesus to abuse that privilege. Dear, friends, let me be really honest with you, okay? After I studied this temptation, uh, I, I, I'm asking myself, Lord, have I abused this privilege? I mean, I wish that I can pray for all of you 100% or, or, or healed. But after I read this, I want to pray. I said, Lord, who do you want me to pray for so that I will do what you tell me to do? Very different, right? Because I think I've got to prove something. And the Lord is saying there's nothing to prove. Jesus knew He's a son. That's it. And as the son, He listens to the father. That's the only thing. See, Satan is trying to get Jesus to focus on position and power. But you know, you, we realize that through this whole episode, God was more interested in the weakness of Jesus at, at that time, His humility, His submission, and His obedience. Tell me which one is more important. Tell me which one do we look at. We tend to look at power and position. Now friends, how do I know that something is wrong down there? Because what does the world look at? Power and position, is it not? Why are we gravitating towards what the world sees as indicators of success? Now, I'm not saying you cannot have position. You already have that. I'm not saying you cannot have power. You already have that. The question is, do you always have to prove it? Because in you trying to prove it, or me trying to prove it, we abuse it. In this teaching, God was more interested in weakness, Humility, submission, obedience. Now you focus on this and you see how power comes to you to defeat the enemy. Amen? 
Paul says, look, there's a messenger from Satan that's sent to, to me. Three times I prayed, remove him, Lord. Or remove this thing, Lord. Whatever your understanding may be. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness, my strength will be perfect. We are serving an upside-down kingdom, friends. It breaks my heart when I hear messages today that try to make us the same as the world. Look at Job and his friends. Job was whacked without even knowing what hit him. Nobody likes this book very much. But you know, Job had his friends come around him. They try to encourage him. And we always say that if you've got friends like this, you don't need enemies. Right? Because they question him. They say, you, you must have done something wrong. You must have sinned. You must have this. You must have that. You must have this. And Job said, look, guys, I did nothing. <laughs> See, Job was trying to defend his position, his own righteousness, as it were. And I think sometimes we are like that. Not Job. We are like his friends. <laughs> Admit it, guys. Right? The moment someone tells us something, we're looking at, oh, you must have sinned, you must have this, you must have that. You, maybe, perhaps. But why don't you just walk with this person, take a step back and journey with them? They have made mistakes, walk with them. But after that, let them know who they are in Christ and let the glory of God take them through. So four temptations, or four sub-points within this temptation. And so there's one last thing that we have to ask ourselves. After we learn this, the temptation is only to talk bread. That we can talk bread so well, but that's all we do. So let's apply this to us as we bring it, you know, to a close and to an application. Let's ask ourselves, do we just talk bread or do we have fresh bread or do we have packaged answers? Now, I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to describe it for the sake of those who are listening to this. But have you seen this floating around the internet? Where just recently, a major bakery in Singapore, no names mentioned, right? One of their staff was seen pouring packaged soya bean milk into bottles that are labeled freshly made. It was a big hoo-ha. Big hoo-ha. But I looked at this today and I asked ourselves, don't laugh at them. Are we the same or not? Each week we get sermons poured into us. Are we ourselves spending time in the Word? Receiving fresh input? Having revelation from the Holy Spirit? Or, or is it just the same, you know, we have packaged thing poured into us? And then we just spew the same package statement. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. His plans for me are good and not of evil. Plans to give me a future and a hope. And my God is able to do it. You know? Oh, just press button. Press button. We know. Oh, Bible memory, very good. But is it freshly made? Is it freshly received? Or are they just packaged answers? Because I tell you, friends, packaged answers will not take you through a time of, of, of temptation. Are we receiving fresh bread so that we can share the same with others? Otherwise, it's, you know, the same old thing. And that's why people don't want to talk to us. Because we Christians, they say something, we say pray long. We say something, we say something long. You know, it's just standard. But with the freshness of it, there's an anointing that comes in that that would break the yoke, that would bring encouragement. The second point for us to remember is to feed on the Word, because you are what you eat. So I like this comic strip there. This character says, don't forget you are what you eat. And this other person says, I need to eat a skinny person. What are we eating? Are we eating the Word? You are what you eat in the physical. In the spiritual, it's the same. Don't put up your hands, but if you only have feeding when you go to church once a week, you are malnourished spiritually. How many of you would eat once a week? You won't. If you're not feeding on the Word, you're not eating the Word, 
Many times God appears to Ezekiel or the angels, to Ezekiel as well as to John, eat the scroll, eat it. And when he took it, it was like, it was bitter, you know, and then, yes, yet, yet there was a sweetness like honey. See, when you take in the word, sometimes it's not easy. To eat, you've got to, you have to chew on that word. You've got to digest it, then it becomes a part of you. You are what you eat. Is this what you eat? Today we're on a fast food diet. I'm sorry if you have not had your dinner. So we've got burgers and fries, and everybody loves burgers and fries. We've got pizzas, totally unhealthy, but we feed our children. Oh, I love this one, lava cake. Chocolate oozing out. That's one of my favorites. Sugar-coated donuts. Friends, do you know that today we are in a fast food church? Many messages are sugar-coated. Feel good. Why? You work too hard, what? Six days a week. Come to church, still get whacked. No, nah. Change church. Yeah, I've, I've heard of people who actually do that. Too, too tough to hear. Go to another church. Ah, this pastor, good. He's very loving. Sugar-coated preaching. Junk food. You are what you eat. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, are we receiving what is pure, what is unadulterated? And God can give nice things, amen? But God can also give not-so-nice stuff. Why? Because He loves us. So I tell people, Love the blessings, heed the warnings. They are both important. The third thing is to hear and to do the word. Let me read to you from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. This is talking about Ezekiel. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the Lord or what the word is that comes from the Lord. Now, this sounds really good, right? People are passing on the flyers. They are sharing the Facebook posts. Come and listen to Ezekiel. This is a prophet of God. Come and hear the word. Wow, so anointed, you know. The teaching is really good. And I'm very happy if you invite someone to Kingdom 101. But the Lord goes on to say this. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. You know, I think preaching has become like an entertainment sport. And I love the pulpit. It's a great privilege for us to stand here to declare the Word of God. But with the internet and with the number of churches, the number of meetings and the anointed, number of anointed speakers, there's such a competition, is it not? No? Uh, who would you go listen to? Who is the anointed one? Who is the one that has a prophetic word? Who has this and who has that? And as preachers, as, as if preaching is not difficult enough, now we have to be a performer. We got to come up with the, the best things. You know, we have to give you the good points. Uh, we have to do good presentations. And we will do all these. But the point is, as the Lord is saying, the people come to hear, but they do not do what they hear. Present company excluded, of course. I hope. Do we hear and do we do? I tell someone, it's not more teaching we need. Do you know really, huh? whatever church or whatever meeting you have, you have been to, even if you stop right now and don't attend any other message, but go back and take those messages and start to apply, it will still be all right. Please come back next week. <laughs> would you agree with me? I mean, how many of you can remember what I preached 16 sessions ago? Right? How do you review and start to look at those things and ask the Lord, are we doing what we are hearing? 
And you cannot claim ignorance because in Ezekiel it says that when it, when it comes to pass, surely it will come. They will know that a prophet has been among them. There's nothing wrong with Ezekiel. He declares the word of God faithfully. And the people cannot say, huh, you mean? Yes, sir. No. He is the prophet. The word has been declared. The onus now is upon you. Will you act on what you have heard? You can't claim ignorance, you see. Of course, finally, we have to live by the word. And the word live by means to depend on the word, to rely on the word, to, to stake your, your everything upon this word. You understand? You live by this word. It's not just living out the word or doing it only, but you're living by it. And I have this phrase that I remind myself and I tell people, I say, if you want to quote the word, be prepared to live by the word. See, otherwise it's rhetoric. It's all talk. And talk is cheap. And that's why in the church it's so easy to talk. We're saying all these things. And I'm not saying it's easy to live by it. I'm just saying, have we even begun to take a step towards this? I shared with you about discipleship already. It's radical. Relying on God more than your physical needs. Radical. It runs against our every grain. That's why Paul says, renew the mind. Change the mind. If you don't change this, you will never be transformed. If you're not transformed, you will not know the will of God. If you don't understand the will of God, how will you know your assignment is aligned with the will of God? If you want to quote the word, be prepared to live by the word. That's why James says in 122, don't, don't just be hearers of the word, deceiving yourself, but be doers. Live it. Live by it. So as we close, let me ask you a question. How are you faring in these temptations? Aren't you glad that Jesus passed the test and that we are all hidden in Him? Amen? I don't think there's one person in this room can, can say that we, we will pass it beautifully. We all trip, we all fail, and that's why we need Jesus. You see that? This is what I want to leave you with. I don't want you to look at it and say, oh, you cannot make it la fail. Uh, you know? I'm not here to tempt you to pull you down. Amen? I'm here to highlight something to you so that you will run to Christ. You need Jesus and I need Jesus. See, temptations are the enemy's attempt to question our identity. You know, even as I share this with you, you know, the next temptation that comes against us will be, oh, since you're a Christian, you mean you're a Christian? Or that how come you don't live like that, you know? He wants to pull you out and he wants to disqualify you. Not only that, if you keep focusing on the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, I can tell you, you will be drawn away. That's why we have to look to Jesus. Colossians 2 tells us we have been raised with Christ. We are hidden in Him. So he says, don't, don't, don't focus on, don't set your mind on things of the earth, but set your mind on things above. And I hope that tonight, and this lesson, you know, I've done enough to just to stir you and to encourage you, to convince you that there is more to life than this physical thing that we are looking at. There's more to it. Sometimes we have to live to a certain age to realize, quite true, huh? I spent my whole life chasing all this. Huh? It means nothing. And then God begins to get our attention. He awakens us and aligns us. And then He assigns us. So seek the spiritual and the eternal, not the physical and the temporal. And so as we close, I want to remind you we don't overcome temptations by our own strength. The same Holy Spirit that was with Jesus, if you believe in Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit was, is with us. Amen? We rest in that. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us so that our eyes are fixed on the right things. We focus on who He is and what He has called us to. We don't just talk about bread. We boast in the bread of life. And so learn from Jesus. Live for Him align with Him, rely on Him, and live by what He says to all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Jesus, the bread of life, 
the living word, the Logos. We thank you, Lord, that he passed the test fully, not just this one temptation, but everything that was hurled at him by the enemy. He was tempted at all points and yet found without sin. He is a faithful high priest. He is deserving, Lord. And without sin, without blemish, Lord, he can present himself as that perfect sacrifice on behalf of all of us. And Lord, we stand into that promise. Lord, there's no condemnation for all of us tonight. No condemnation because we are already in Christ. But Lord, show us so that we can live lives worthy of what He has done for us and what He went through for us. Lord, we yield our weaknesses to You. Lord, You know we face temptations every day, every moment. If you have that need right now to ask the Lord for strength, will you just quietly from where you are, just say, Lord, help me. I'm fighting this temptation, Lord. Lord, help me, Lord. And so, Lord, enable us, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. As we look to you, we know you will make us, and you have already made us, more than conquerors in Christ. Help us to walk with one another, to encourage each other, and to be who we are to be in Christ and to complete what you have given to us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.